Welcome to the 2020 James M. Scott Exceptional Design Awards. I'm your host, Brian Ashby. In this program, we're celebrating design excellence in architecture and honoring the architects whose contributions strengthen our communities and enhance the architect profession. I'm very excited to be a part of this annual event. Thank you to everyone who helped pull it together. The Exceptional Design Awards stands as a distinctive platform for recognizing exceptional architecture and to raise awareness of outstanding planning and design projects among design professionals and the general public. To date, more than 250 projects have been awarded through this program for design excellence throughout Fairfax County. The Design Awards are sponsored by the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and administered by the County's Department of Planning and Development in cooperation with the County's Architectural Review Board and the Northern Virginia Chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Before we get to the awards portion of our program, I want to tell you about James Scott, the person for whom this awards program is named. James M. Scott was a former member of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, and as a supervisor for the Providence District from 1972 to 1987, he was a strong advocate for many quality of life issues. Mr. Scott recognized the connection between quality architecture and the county's rapidly growing and evolving future. In 1984, just as construction and development in the county were poised to take off, he, along with other board members, established the Exceptional Design Awards. On May 16, 2017, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors authorized the renaming of this awards program to the James M. Scott Exceptional Design Awards in his honor. It was his vision and leadership that led to the establishment of these awards now in their third decade. Supervisor Scott passed away on April 13, 2017. This year, we are honoring nine winning entries in the following five categories. Residential, Recreational, Commercial, Commercial Interiors, and Institutional. Awards are bestowed at three levels, Honorable Mention, Merit, and the Honor Award, the highest award given. The jury, composed of building and design industry professionals, judged the entries based on the criteria of superior work of architecture, total site design and landscaping, the context of the work in relationship to its surroundings, and applied energy and water conservation and other green building practices. Our distinguished panel of judges include K. Orr, jury chair. Ms. Orr is a registered architect and sole proprietor of her own company. She also serves as an appointed member of the Fairfax County Architectural Review Board. J. Paul Lewis. Mr. Lewis is a registered architect with more than 35 years experience and co-chair of the Northern Virginia AIA Design Awards program. Sharon Bradley, founder of Bradley Site Design. Ms. Bradley is an award-winning landscape architect with more than 36 years of experience. Joseph McCoy. Mr. McCoy is a registered architect with Sanchez Palmer Architects in Alexandria. This is his second year participating as a juror. Charles Todd. Mr. Todd is a registered architect that has served on the board of AIA Northern Virginia since 2019 and has served on and co-chaired the AIA Northern Virginia Design Awards Committee since 2018. He is also the Chief Operating Officer at Little Diversified Architectural Consulting. Robert Navarez. Mr. Navarez is the Director of Inclusion for the Virginia Chapter of the American Planning Association. A very special thank you goes out to all of our judges for the time and expertise they contributed to this awards program. Our first award category is Honorable Mention, and we have five winning design entries. Burke Lake Golf Facilities, Honorable Mention in the Recreational category. Fairfax County Herndon Station Parking Garage, Honorable Mention in the Institutional category. High Low House, Honorable Mention in the Residential category. Jacobs, Honorable Mention in the Commercial Interior category and Lidos Global Headquarters, 
honorable mention in the commercial category. Congratulations, everyone. Well, it was unique in that it, it's a rec recreation facility, and often those are really not, frankly, uh, designed in a sophisticated manner. And we found this was quite sophisticated. It was integrated well into the site. We found that um, it really was nestled into the topography very well, and it really became part of the landscape, which I really appreciated. It was uh, very unique in that respect. Um, its materiality uh, also respected the site. It had naturalized materials, and in that way, it was also very well integrated into the site. And it just made it look like more of a, a civic building than uh, a recreational structure. And so it, it held more gravitas, frankly, than um, you often see in recreational um, facilities. Often these are very utilitarian structures, these kinds of things. And if you've been to other golf facilities, it's really sort of a bare bones nod to um, pure function. And uh, this went well beyond that. This again had a civic presence on the site and it really was a very welcoming facility, uh, much more elegant, much more sophisticated than you would usually see. First, uh, let's talk about the site challenges. There were three key site challenges, the site uh, impact, uh, the operations, as well as the architecture. Uh, the project has, uh, the existing site itself has a lot of trees, and that was one of the key uh, uh, constraints of maintaining the existing trees. So for it, our layout uh, kept the existing trees. We put the driving range where the existing driving range was, so, and the parking expansion was also uh, situated where there is very minimal impact on the existing site. So site was a very key one when we, uh, on the design part. From the operations, the, the building, uh, the existing building, the original clubhouse has to maintain, uh, to be maintained operationals and, um, the key again of the operation is really the driving range. So we have to accelerate the driving range construction um, in terms of the sequencing of the uh, project. And the last one is really the architecture. Again, branding was uh, giving it a new brand, uh, maintaining an open and inviting uh, a feel of the building and blending it with a surrounding surroundings is one of the very key approach of this building. The building is this very simple shed roof um, element supported by um, kind of like a tree-like structure, you know, uh, uh, steel elements that also reflect some of the uh, trees around the uh, the complex. So those are the key ones that uh, how we approach the design of this facility. Capturing the beautiful landscape was the well-executed design intent in the Hilo house. The large home was broken into two sections stepping down the hill with landscape in between. The home is tucked into the hill, allowing the site its own presence, reducing the visual impact of this otherwise large home. Well-crafted and restrained in material and color, it has a spare minimalist character consistent in both architecture and site. We think it's an exceptional project. <laughs> The uh, the house is conceived is began as a high a, an upper house and a lower house. It's a 1970s house that a gentleman built for himself and his family. Uh, and it was built in a very, you know, basic way, I'll say, not sophisticated. So there's an upper house and lower house and a connecting staircase, and you entered in the middle. Um, so the owners who had purchased it, the couple that we worked for, it was just two of them, no children. They decided to make the upper house their bedroom wing and the, make the entire lower house all uh, living space. So you still enter from the middle, but 
used a little differently. But previously, the lower house had a lot of different rooms in it and a lot of, and kind of a rabbit warren, including some bedrooms. So we, we decided after looking at the construction, which was quite, um, you know, basic, as I said, <laughs> give it a negative connotation, we realized it was best to just take the entire lower house down to the, to the slab, but we did retain the slab. One big problem is they were both pitched roof buildings and the upper house is fine as a pitched roof. It's sort of, as you approach the site, it's low lying, very simple, clean, no problem. When you go to the lower house, it, it steps down the site by one level. So it has a fantastic view of the rest of the full site from the back, which wasn't being taken advantage of with a very low eight foot ceiling. So our idea was to take the same pitch that it had, but, to, but take it down, rebuild it, but take that pitch up and use that same slope to slope as one shed roof instead of a sloped, uh, instead of a um, split roof, you know, instead of a, that, that shape, we shaped it as one plane. And that view now is over 20 feet and we made it all glass towards the view. So that's number one. We took the same footprint, basically the same house. So not disturbing the site at all and made it into by one move, one simple change of the roof, made it a completely different experience. Um, that allowed us to incorporate obviously one big large space, which you can see from the photographs. We made it, we thought of it as a large modern barn, because again, you're in a rural part of Virginia there in, in Great Falls and they have a six acre site. So they're very isolated. So the idea that a barn used to be built of wood, now it, this, this kind of span has to be built from steel. So it's like a steel barn steel frame barn, we wanted to expose all the steel to show that construction, just like you would in an old barn. Um, and then we added a loft space above. And overall, um, as, although it's, it's all interconnected spaces, there are still private and small areas incorporated. There's an office in one part of it. <clears throat> the kitchen, the back wall of the kitchen does not go all the way up. So it allows um, it to breathe all the way around it, but you still have privacy on the kitchen side. There's a small den there under the um, mezzanine, which has a smaller scale ceiling. So within that large space, there's a lot of different types of spaces going on. And again, that, that very grand 20 foot, you know, by sort of 70 foot long view is pretty spectacular. And we also added a very large high ceilinged screen porch um onto the house which they really wanted and there actually is a pool further back and so that's on the side of the pool um because they live really inside outside so there's a multi-slide door that can open that wall between the house and the porch to become one big long space One of the major topics that the jury discussed was by awarding uh, prizes to these projects, we are essentially saying we would like to see more of this kind of project uh, in Fairfax County. And I think that is certainly true of this parking garage. Um, it is essentially a utilitarian use, but it has been treated uh, almost as a civic building uh, with the use of materials, uh, craft in its detailing, and uh, also just the way that it um, is an urban presence in that area of Fairfax County. It is really treated as a building that is intended to be a presence and to contribute to the urban uh, landscape rather than be a back of house use. Um, and the, the technical challenge of getting the walkway, uh, the overhead walkway for both uh, pedestrians and the overhead driveway for cars connecting one garage to another is really well detailed, high level of craft, uh, well beyond what's just needed for the utility of it. And we felt like that attention to detail really showed that um, a, a project that is essentially a, a background use can really become a contributor to urban landscape and, and a, the civic fabric. So this is, this is a, a metro parking garage to serve the coming uh, Silver Line Phase Two. And there is an existing parking structure at the Herndon site, and there's an existing bus terminal. So this project was intended to uh, expand the parking capacity in anticipation of the metro. And while so to main, it is going to maintain the existing parking, maintain the bus functionality, but find a spot for this new garage 
uh, also on this on this larger site. And so there was a study that we did early on to determine the best place to, to place the new garage while maintaining the functionality of the old garage. We put the garage in the one spot that allowed maximum flexibility for the rest of that site for the future. So it was all about maintaining um, future possibilities for the balance of the site. And, and in order to do that, we actually had to buy, uh, the county had to buy a small parcel of the adjacent land um, in order to fit the garage where we, where we wanted. So it was a bit of a, a complicated process for procuring that, that acreage for the, for the building. The, the real trick was once we placed this building, we then had to connect the new garage with the still there existing garage for both pedestrians and vehicles. So if people park in this new garage, they have to be able to get over to the existing garage because that's the where the metro is going to tie in the existing garage. From a design sense, I think one of the most successful components of this garage is the bridge connection that we created between these two structures. Part of what we, part of the design challenge was to be sensitive to the fact that there is this uh, neighborhood uh, that's, that's in close proximity. So we did a couple of things. First, we, we took the top uh, level of the garage and we set it back sort of steps so that it, it lowers the building mass and profile relative to the road. Uh, the other thing is we used a mixture of different colors. Um, so it's a, it's a precast concrete structure, but it's clad with brick. So we have some of the reddish warm tones and we have some of the more buff uh, tones. So we sort of intentionally uh, tried to break up the scale of this, of this building. I mean, it's, you can't completely camouflage a building of that size, but we, we tried to be sensitive to, um, to the neighbors. There is uh, some metal it's called expanded metal mesh the material that is between so there the the garage is, is sort of in bands right you have the, the the a brick band and then a space then a brick band we put expanded metal mesh in the in the space uh between and what that allowed us to do was to shield the car lights from hitting that neighborhood so so as cars pull in Again, it was kind of another level of trying to be sensitive to the neighbors. That light does not spill out over into the adjacent neighborhood. And we used high cutoff fixtures for the, for the lights at the, at the roof. So we tried to take as many measures as we could to be a good neighbor, um, while at the same time, you know, uh, adhering to the, the scope, which is a large, you know, 2,000 car uh, garage. So I think, I think there was, um, an appreciation to the level of that we went to to uh, to, to break down the scale, uh, to use materials that were, you know, sort of warm tones, um, sort of friendly tones, and and uh, uh, while still maintaining the you know the, the the real core purpose, which is to promote uh, mass transportation with the with the metro. We were really impressed um, as we deliberated about this project uh, because, first of all, it's a very simple palette of materials. Uh, there's not a lot of extravagance in the way that this project is detailed, um, but it's very carefully detailed and it's very comfortable. Um, it also uh, really suits well the use of the building in that there are areas for uh, private work, there are areas for uh, communal gathering and social spaces, uh, areas for reception, and now, all of those are pulled together in what really is an economical uh, project. I, um, I think we were just impressed by the fact that they're not relying on um, you know, high-end materials or lighting to make the statement. They do it with the way that the simple palette and the parts and pieces that they had are, are put together. So it, it's elevating a workspace for the people that are there to something more than just a, a place to do work. It really is a community setup and, and a place that we would have all been um, very happy to work in. Uh, the, the, the project that we did for Jacobs was um, a project that was a two-story um, 
new office fit out for the organization. Uh, they actually acquired another uh, company as a, as a result of, of this completion of this space. And um, just to tell you a bit about it, the, the notion was to really create more of a inside out looking uh, facing um, concept. The old paradigm that they came out of was one where the offices more or less ring the perimeter and uh, there wasn't as much daylight really filtering into the space. So big push to really borrow that light, get the light into the space, uh, move the office's interior with glass and really push the staff toward the windows where they could really benefit from that natural light. Uh, the leadership very much wanted to create a very dynamic uh, intersection where the arrival point was for both the staff and the visitor. So um, one will encounter as they enter the Jacobs space, uh, what we call the social hub. And it's really a, a large cafe uh, performance area with a, uh, a grand connecting stair that really makes the two floors feel linked and part of that social hub. Uh, that was the big idea that this wouldn't be tucked away somewhere in a corner, that it was front and center as you entered the space. And so we thought, uh, that that was something that was worth putting out for um, for your all's interest in seeing the kind of work that we think is creating innovation in the workplace uh, with these types of social spaces. And that's, I, I believe, was a big part of the driver for um, the awards uh, that you, you've honored us with. So the concept for this project was architectural disruption. We really wanted to pull from the company's dynamic culture and the way that they view themselves amongst the GovCon world and really being a uh, disruptor in, in the community. So we, we really branched off from that to create a really dynamic space. Um, but in terms of the overall space, it's, it's very linear. It's very orthogonal in nature. So we really wanted to break up some of that linear patterns throughout the space by introducing angles and dynamic forms that really draw draw users to certain areas of the, the plan to, to highlight. So one of those areas being the social hub. So this is really the, the jewel of the space. It's where, you know, the employees meet and gather and collaborate throughout the day, also hosting after hours events as well. It's also directly adjacent to the reception area and the two story communicating monumental stair. So by introducing angles in this space and breaking away from the orthogonal grid of the space plan, it really creates um, an energy within the space and um, really gives a company a, a great um, asset that they can use throughout the day. It also takes advantage of the great views that it has to Dulles Airport. You can sit in the cafe and watch the planes take off all day, which is really unique to that space. So we really wanted to highlight that and you know, bring the outdoors in as well by introducing some biophilia. So the space really feels like you're sitting kind of on the tarmac watching, watching the planes go by. Well, the Lidos Global Headquarters is a very interesting building because it represents a perfect example of varying styles of architecture coexisting uh, in the same urban environment. The original Reston Town Center architecture uh, was designed to be a cohesive element to that whole development. And this new Lidos Global Headquarters is an interesting gateway signature building as you enter one of the main entranceways into Reston Town Center. The skin is different from all of the other buildings surrounding it, but creates a wonderful uh, juxtaposition to those buildings. Uh, its skin is all glass uh, with a articulation of vertical fins, which creates a wonderful verticality to the building. And also because the plan is unique and has some undulations in it, it gives some character to the outside of the building rather than just being your typical glass box. All of the eco features of the building have given it the ability to win a LEED Gold certification 
which is something that all new buildings should strive to do to create an eco environment for all of us. I designed the building to be an appropriate entry landmark building for one of the final development sites at the Reston Town Center um, master planned area. Uh, the site is part of uh, the signature site. It's, it's uh, one of the last parcels to be developed in Reston Town Center. And I wanted to make sure that the building was an appropriate uh, design in terms of its language and approach to uh, both be an appropriate marker for the entry, but also fit in architecturally with the considerable amount of uh, buildings that have been developed in Reston Town Center. So I used a modern architectural language of a very glass building, um, spent time breaking down the building into a series of volumes so that it would have proportion and scale and meet uh, in with a larger neighborhood, but then um, added a layer of articulation to it uh, which was a metal uh, scrim or metal framework across all of the facades to give the building an interesting scale and texture and soften the glass aspect. So I think it's a, a nice relief to a lot of the precast concrete and, and masonry and stone buildings. It's a slightly different material approach, but through its proportion, scale and texture, uh, it fits in appropriately and addresses not only the corner location, but the the uh, view from Reston Town Center uh, along Reston Parkway. So it's an appropriate, hopefully, landmark building for this um, very interesting location. The main challenge that I faced was um, the, the breaking down the scale of the building. It's a rather tall building in Reston Town Center, one of the taller buildings. Uh, and so it had to fit in with buildings which were of a shorter scale. And it also, it was a very unique uh, challenge because there were sort of two scales that I had to address in designing the building. First was the scale of Market Street, which is a really wonderful walking pedestrian street uh, that's the heart of Reston Town Center. There's a certain scale and texture to make people feel comfortable. The building has to sort of address that scale. So that was a, that was a, a, a one scale challenge. And on the other challenge, I knew the building would be visible from a distance, uh, from the east and from the south, from Reston Town Center Parkway and from the uh, Dulles Toll Road. The building would have visibility from those as well. So it had to, had to both address the skyline and the larger, more distant views, but also the intimate walking street of, of, of uh, a Market Street in the center of Reston Town Center. So I tried to address those two scales uh, differently uh, in the shaping and organizing of the building massing and proportion. Next, we have the Merit Award and its two winning design entries. Innova Mather Proton Therapy Center receives the Merit Award in the institutional category. And the Divine House receives the Merit Award in the residential category. Congratulations. The Inova Mather Proton Therapy Center tells a compelling story that even within the confines of a strict regulatory program, one can find a solution that is uniquely sympathetic to the vulnerable state, both physically and emotionally, of the patients who will be treated there. Through a tightly controlled palette of material, color, form, and lighting, the center conveys a sense of respect and calm in this award-winning patient-centered design. Um, so the the center, which was um, built as part of the cancer center, although it was a, a distinct separate part of the project, the Proton Center um, really, um, I think it featured the opportunity to fully integrate it with the other radiation oncology programs, as well as to create a unified aesthetic between the um, the Proton Center and the adjacent new cancer center. The, um, we have two proton therapy treatment rooms in the center, um, and those, um, if you don't know what proton therapy is, it, it is a form of radiation, but the equipment that, um, that's used to target the tumors is, is very large equipment. Um, 
really the the idea was to use the the natural elements and to kind of supplement the wood tones with the use of you know kind of soft organic shapes so we often have very long corridors that connect the treatment rooms and you know you don't want those to feel monotonous uh, to patients so these we use some soft organic shapes to help also um, break down the space and those those patterns were copied on the ceiling and into the floor and they helped articulate the major circulation nodes. Um, these are big rooms with a lot of equipment and how do you bring that down to a scale that is um, appropriate for, for a patient. And um, one of the unique features in this facility is a ambient lighting system. When patients go into a room for treatment, they have the ability to select scenes and to select colors. Um, and it really helps, um, you know, soften their entire experience. So it's, 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 a, it's really a challenge to take all this technology that comes into this room from, from the lighting system to controls to all of the devices on the wall to, um, you know, radiation, monitoring and, and make that all kind of disappear um, and so I think if you've seen any of the photos of, of the finished product you'll, you'll see that it's really nicely integrated well the divine house is a good example of a house that all the jury members wish we were living in it it is a, an excellent example of how to do a contemporary architectural language in a comfortable setting uh, so that really it could have appeal to a, a wide range of people. And it, it overcomes a lot of the challenges that a contemporary architectural language has. Uh, one of the things that was most striking is just the way that, uh, I mean, it's not a, a, a small house. It, it is large, but the, uh, the massing and the way the house is put together really allows it to be grand in some areas, all the way down to fairly um, small and, and more intimate areas where uh, the level of activity is less and uh, it is intended to be a more quiet and private space. Uh, the areas around the building are also um, really well handled, especially on the front side of the building. The car really almost disappears as a necessity in this building. In the, uh, the garage where the car is stored is tucked under the house, under an overhang. The driveway is actually more of an outdoor terrace. And if a car is not sitting in there or is in the garage, you would have no idea that that is the entry uh, for uh, the parking garage. It really is an outdoor usable terrace. On the back side of the building, there are a number of smaller areas that make this uh, larger house quite usable and quite at a human scale and uh, easily uh, usable for small gatherings as well as um, a larger connection out into the site. So it, it, overall, it's just a comfortable palette of materials, well put together, um, restrained, but refined in its detailing and uh, a, a really nice, comfortable place to be. So we were quite impressed. The, the context for the house is a um, kind of typical suburban environment, uh, very lovely, um, wide street, lots of views, lots of sun. Um, but the house that was on the site was probably built in the 50s. It was a low brick rambler. And what we did was we, we looked at that and decided that we would do something rather different. Um, the clients are, uh, one is from Canada and the other is from France. So they brought a kind of a sophisticated international look at the at the property. Um, they were particularly concerned with natural light, um, with the ability to develop the landscape. Um, and we worked with Campion Ruby landscape architects from the beginning, which is very common for us. Um, so looking at the site, we developed a um, an entry facing the street. Uh, and a parking court facing the street um, with a relatively hidden garage and a, and a kind of a front porch element um, so that, you know, they could sit on the, on, in the front and look out at the landscape. The other thing that we did was we made the house relatively thin um, so that light would be everywhere. 
um, with a kitchen pavilion at the back and a master bedroom pavilion at the back. It was important to us and the client uh, to make a courtyard in the rear and also, you know, facing the pool um, and also to give a little bit of a sense of enclosure back there. You know, getting to know the clients is always this uphill battle of getting everybody to be on the same page. And, you know, these clients in particular wanted a more contemporary styled house, which was a fun, exciting challenge for us, right? And and I think it, it just took a few, you know, there was a lot of interaction with them. They, they loved to sketch. They, you know, they were clearly taking their kids' um, crayons and colored pencils and graph paper and wanting to, it to be this very collaborative process. And so I think that was actually very enjoyable, right, to have them be that connected with their project and that interested in that willing to you know, participate, right, in their project. For me, it's it's this continuity of the materials, right? We've got we've got these these very clean, simple massings that is where the you know the idea of the project started. We we built around this you know two story volume in the middle, and we eroded each of the pieces in a slightly different way, you know, wanting the pieces to relate to each other and wanting it to feel like you know it wasn't just three things slammed together right they they all speak to each other right the wood the natural materials whether it's in the screens or the eaves or the um or the walls right and it and it's something that continues from the inside to the outside and i think that it's you know done in, in a successful way and finally the honor award, the highest honor given in this awards program. And we have two winning entries. 3347 Sheffield Court receives the honor award in the residential category and the Potomac School Spangler Center for Community and Athletics receives the honor award in the institutional category. Congratulations to our two honor award recipients. Well, 3347 Sheffield Court is a wonderful example of how existing classic architecture, now over 60 years old, can be preserved and modern amenities can be added to it to create a modern residence. The uh, tendency in these neighborhoods is to tear down the existing because this building had some issues uh, and to build a new, more modern facility. In this case, the owner uh, and the architect and the builder all strived to create uh, an homage and a wonderful uh, honoring of the existing architecture uh, while adding the new amenities. And as you can see throughout the photographs, they not only uh, paid homage to the existing architectural details, but they enhanced the whole space. They kept many of the materials that they had taken down for expansion and reused them in other pieces in the house. So it's a wonderful example of how to minimize uh, the destruction of existing and creating more uh, product for landfills and enhancing it and creating a wonderful space for a family to live in that they didn't have before. We, we work on a lot of mid-century homes and contemporary homes. And one of the main themes of our projects is to not overwhelm the initial design, but actually take cues from what the architect was originally intending to do. And then also look at the materials and the, the general sense of the house and try to add to that and to try to make that um, like add a new layer that relates to today's type of living. Meaning we'll go in and if the kitchen was initially in a small room and enclosed room, we'll try to bring the kitchen out into an open space so you have a combined living, dining and, and kitchen area. Um, so that was one of, the, one of the, uh, the elements that we incorporated in this design 
Um, but for the most part, the, the design and what we were intending to do was just to really rehabilitate the house. And uh, it, what we do, it's not necessarily architectural preservation because that would be fixing it up exactly the way it is. What we're really trying to do is to, in an economical sense, come in and to reuse what's there. So in terms of a design for economy, it's, it's pretty difficult to be more economical than to actually reuse the whole existing structure. So from a green building standpoint, we really just keep what's there. In this particular house, um, we inserted a really large window down in the basement and by seven foot tall by six foot six wide area. And that not only does that allow light to enter into this rehabilitated space, let's call it, mm -hmm. it also allows you to see out into the landscape. And um, one of the main themes of mid-century modern homes are that there's a lot of glass. One, it's a very honest building and you can see the beams and the structure. And then usually in between the beams and the structure, there's large floor to ceiling glass windows. And in, in most of them are single, single glazed windows, which are very inefficient. It's almost like just having a sheet in, in your window frame. So in this, in, for this house, we basically removed all of the existing windows and um, we put in uh, insulated glass units low E, um, high performance windows. Um, there was a lot of uh, mahogany wood used in the living spaces. So overall the building was very dark and it was, it, it didn't have a, a light cheery feel and it didn't feel very reflective. So when the light came in, it was really deadened. So we removed a lot of the mahogany wood off the walls and we reuse that in other locations. Another area where we basically reuse a lot of um, the existing materials is we jackhammered the existing driveway, which was concrete, and then we reuse that for pavers. Um, another big part of, of, you know, of these homes are, they, you know, they have beams and they have wood ceilings. Here we did a whole new roof system and then we put four inches of rigid insulation on the top of the roof. So insulation is a, is a critical part to um, rehab in these buildings. You really want to come back in with a much stronger and a higher R value for the insulation systems. I think my favorite element of the design is the extension of the living room into the existing screen porch. So the in 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 that in that larger space is now the kitchen and the living room and the dining room and they're all combined. We built the windows to match the existing um, window profile. So it's actually become a little bit of um, just an extension of what's there, but I think it's really difficult for someone coming into the house to actually understand what was the old and what was the new. And I think it's, it's with, when we work on these mo or older modern buildings, it's really important to try to find a way to blur that line. So you just can't, you don't understand where, where the, the old and the new are. Although it was very uh, massive in its scale, it really respected the site. And again, it really integrated well into the site and became um, very seamless, uh, almost as if it was always there. It really seemed to grow naturally out of its, um, out of its uh, environment there. The materiality picked up um, natural elements of the site, the stone, the glass, the, the wood, the columns even seemed to replicate the forest that that surrounds it just seemed like to be it, it was a natural part of its environment. Um, we uh, really like the the shared naturalized vocabulary that they used both for the design of the building and for the design of the site elements around it. Um, and then in, in its in its more uh, broad context there on the site. And so it, again, fit quite seamlessly, even though it was a very large structure, it fits quite seamlessly into its, into its setting.
another thing that we liked about it is that the wayfinding uh, elements were very effective and again, very much uh, consistent with the other architectural vocabulary in the uh, building and the site elements. The scale of a building that has to house that much programming um, can tend to overwhelm a site and it can tend to dominate it in such a way that um, it looks out of place in its context. And they seem to have been able to overcome it in, in its form and in its materiality. The Potomac School is a, a school that uh, sits up on a hill and uh, the, it's a collection of buildings, all the K through 12. And uh, the, our site was the next hill over. So it wasn't part of the main campus. So that was a big challenge unto itself. So our concept for that site, which was heavily wooded around all the edges, was to create, take advantage of the site and create a light filled room uh, that could be used for about anything and then hold up the roof of that room with trees. And uh, so we created structural trees to hold up the, this very simple uh, room to, that supports uh, community and athletic events. Uh, the, uh, the structural trees are uh, heavy timber. They're these very long, 40 foot long, wood, tapered wood columns. And uh, to put those up, we had to kind of put the roof structure up first, then add the columns. So it was backwards as uh, compared to a typical building. And, and uh, so that was uh, a challenge in the construction and the design. I think it was uh, working with the owner is always the challenge, the positive challenge in finding the right balance of sport, fun, and non-sport, and, and we worked really hard to find that balance. Um, the way it met the design criteria was, it's a building that's not just a gym, it's a well-rounded building like the school. It serves a whole variety of sports, but also community events. So you can have uh, talks and theater and a school assembly, uh, movies, uh, all other, a lot of other kind of multi-purpose events in there. It's a place for kids to hang out. Uh, it's a place for, if you think about a sports facility, it's where schools, kids from other schools come and visit. That's where they get to know you. So, or parents or the rest of the community. So uh, it had all of those purposes. Uh, it wanted to be healthy. So it's filled with light. It's up in the trees. It uses uh, heavy timber and cross laminated timber for its structure. So it reduced carbon, um, all of the sustainable things you want to do right now. We want to uh, capture water. We're right next to a pond. We're right next to a resource protection area. So rather than walk through it, we built a bridge over the resource protection area. So it's uh, good for the community, good for the environment. And then it just is a quality building. You want to do a building that lasts a long time. This brings us to the end of this year's program. Thank you for joining us. And on behalf of the 2020 James M. Scott Exceptional Design Awards, I would like to extend a very special thank you to our design jury. And again, congratulations to this year's awardees and actually all entrants on your outstanding work and award-winning architecture. Continue elevating the architecture and design in our community. We hope to see you in person next year to showcase the county's exceptional design award winners.